of radiation were calculated. We have, we have been looking at the diffuse component in particular, where we have shown a couple of um, um, models that would uh, just represent that diffuse part. Part of them is the isotropic part, in addition to the uh, circumsolar diffusion, horizontal brightening, in addition to the beam component and definitely, definitely a reflected one. Then we've been looking into this mathematical expression uh, of this model, where basically it's given, as you can see here in equation 214.1, the first component is the beam component, and the other three are the different components of the diffuse. And the last one basically is the reflected amount uh, of, of energy. And then we have seen simplifications to this model in calculations of the diffuse component. One of them is the isotropic model. It means that it is irrespective of the direction. And that has been given as some sort of a simplification to the model. So far, we are looking at how to simplify the equations here so that we can make use of the radiation shape factor to be able to calculate it based on the surface area of uh, the surface that we are studying and its shape factor to the, to the surrounding, whether it is to the sky or to the horizontal uh, direction or even to the ground. And these components have been combined here in equation 214.3, the, the five elements that are making uh, the, the total irradiance, whether it is being uh, on an hourly basis or an average value. And for the isotropic model, we said that we are going only to consider uh, the case, which is we are taking only one parameter out of these, we are basically not considering the circumsolar component and not considering the horizontal component, we're only considering the radiation from the surface to the sky because it's isotropic. So the others would not have a meaning to be added. And then we use the expression to, of the shape factor to come up with a simplified way where we can represent uh, the solar radiation or the solar irradiance for a certain period of time, as you can see it here. And it ended up with the three components. One is the beam radiation, one is the isotropic diffuse radiation, and one is the reflected radiation from the ground. And then the ratio of this quantity to the total radiation is given as by dividing by I so that we can get the component or the fraction R. We had an example on that where we calculated this quantities here based on that isotropic model, after which we said that that's fine. Let's look at the isotropic model is the simplest one. It's commonly used, but we know that when it comes to the issue of being accuracy, it's the least accurate one. So that this has been replaced by, or this has been actually uh, leading us to introducing a couple of other representations or approximations. And the approximations are going to be shared with you here through the anisotropic uh, sky model in which we have either the HDK, HDKR model, which is basically a little bit of addition to the uh, isotropic model, and the Paris model, which is more detailed, and as usual, getting uh, a little bit more complex in the expression, it means that it becomes a little bit more accurate, but it's tedious in terms of calculations. Okay. The HDKR model is the one which is uh, commonly used in, in many, many of, uh, of the applications that we have, and you will see eventually with the rest of the course that we'll be relying on uh, either the isotropic model or the HDKR model in our calculations of radiation, diffuse radiation on a tilted surface. So here, this is a summary of what I just said now that uh, which of those models for the total radiation should be used. The isotropic model is the simplest. It is 
The most conservative estimate is being given, which means that it is the least accurate among the three. However, it's widely used because of its simplicity. The HDKR model is relatively simple, but its values, its results are closer to the act you, to, to the true values, to the, the kind of values that you would have measured if you are using your uh, instrumentations. And then finally, the Paris model is more complex. As you have seen, it has more components in, but and it, it sometimes gives an overestimation, slightly higher total radiation on tilted surfaces, but it is the one which is closest to the actual values. Um, yeah, here are the are parts that um, we're not going to cover. I'm just putting it to you here so that it's some sort of a um, relying on it's some sort of uh, your readings, which is the section talking about the radiation augmentation and um, beam radiation on moving surfaces. The average radiation on sloped surfaces in case of isotropic sky. So here what we are doing is a generalization to what we have done for a while ago. So we need to calculate the total radiation on sloped surfaces from the measurements of a horizontal surface. We use this for the calculations of the design case, as we will see later in, when we come to the applications. And in general, probably I just reiterate what I mentioned earlier, that what we are doing here in these chapters is laying the foundation for the procedure that you are going to use later in the applications. So the first five chapters is basically some sort of uh, talking about geometric issues uh, and being able to calculate the components of the irradiance which are falling, comparing the irradiance on the ground with the extraterrestrial values. All of these are just some sort of preparations, being able to calculate the irradiance based on the time of the day, the place within the earth so, and, and the month uh, of the year, all of these are kind of ways to estimate solar irradiance at any time, at any location. Then these values are going to be considered as a basis for the design and performance estimation of solar collectors, for example. The first method that is being given for the calculations of uh, the average irradiance on sloped surface is the model given by Leo and Jordan that has been extended by Klein. And Klein, by the way, is the one who, uh, who developed the software, which is the engineering equation solver, the EES that we have been using uh, extensively in, in our department. So if the diffuse and ground reflected radiation are assumed isotropic. So in a similar manner, uh, manner, in analogy to what we did earlier, the monthly mean solar radiation on an unshaded tilted surface can be expressed by, you can see here similar to the three components that we have seen earlier. The first one is the beam component. The second one is the isotropic diffuse component. And the third one is the reflected uh, from the ground component or the component that represents reflection from the ground. When we divide that by H, so we get uh, the, the R, which is the ratio here, then uh, you're dividing the whole equation by H. It's the diffuse equation, which is uh, uh, actually, you know that the diffuse equation plus the beam equation makes the total radiation. And this is what uh, explains the one minus HD over H that we see in the first term here. Up there, it was HB, beam radiation. Beam radiation is the total radiation minus diffuse radiation. So it's basically H minus HD. And this is what we have given here. When we divide it by H, then it becomes one minus the ratio of HD over H, RB, and then again, HD over H into the shape factor, and then rho, reflectivity of the ground into the shape factor from the ground. The HD over H is a function of KT, as we have seen in figure uh, 
12 2 this this is a figure that we've seen last time and we've seen how using the kt which is in the x axis you can get the value of h d over h based on which uh, season of the year are we are talking about uh, which is basically related to the sunset hour so the seasons we have the spring autumn and summer have a value whereas the winter has a different ws value so the ratio of the average daily beam radiation on a tilted surface to that on a horizontal surface is Rb, which is equal to H beam tilted over H beam on a horizontal surface, which is related to the transmissions of, transmittance of the atmosphere. However, when Liu and Jordan made the calculations, they made it as if there's no atmosphere. So they just neg neglected the attenuation occurring to the radiation by the atmosphere, just come up with an approximate way of the calculations. The surfaces that are sloped toward the equator in the northern part of the hemisphere, they are facing uh, tilted to the equator, it means that they are facing south, so the value of gamma is equal to zero. And this is the expression of Rb. And the corresponding value of Ws dash that you see here in this equation is given as the minimum value of these two components. If we are talking about the southern part of the hemisphere, then the, the angle is going to change. Instead of saying phi minus beta, it becomes phi plus beta. So as long as we are talking about the northern part of the hemisphere, which is basically where we, where we live and stay, so it's the upper equation that we are going to use. The numerator of the equation is the uh, extraterrestrial radiation on a tilted surface, whereas the denominator is the extraterrestrial duration on a horizontal surface. Each of these parameters is, is, or each of these terms is obtained by the integration of equation 162, the equation of the angle of instance. It's the one which is given by very small or tiny letters down there as a reminder. So we do integrate this equation over a certain time period from true sunrise up to sunset for the horizontal surface and from apparent sunrise to apparent sunset on a tilted surface. And that's an interesting issue. So probably you would wonder what is meant by true and apparent sunrise, for example. I'll show that in a while, in which uh, I, I put here a couple of, of information that will help us looking at or knowing what's meant by the true or apparent uh, sunrise and, uh, and, and sunset as well. Basically, as the sun rises, it's before dawn or early morning, it is below the horizon. However, as the sun ray comes to the atmosphere, based on the air mass, some sort of uh, uh, change in the direction of the beam or break in the direction of the beam as it enters into different layers of the atmosphere can result in having or seeing the sun in a different location compared to the actual location that it has. This is very well explained in, uh, even with, with a video in the, in the YouTube file that I put the link down there. So I'd recommend so much that you run this file and uh, get the idea of what is meant by the apparent versus the true or actual sunrise. And this also applies to the sunset. It at the end results in a two minutes uh, difference between the actual sunrise and the apparent value of the sunrise. So the RB is a function of the latitude of various slopes for gamma equal to zero or uh, surfaces that are facing south as being shown in figure 219 and the corresponding value of RBs are given in the appendix of the book. These values of RB are used for surface azimuth angle zero in the northern hemisphere, 180 in the southern hemisphere with a little error I mean, if we consider it plus or minus 15, which means that you would, all, you would not only use it for 
surfaces that are strictly facing south, but some sort of a tolerance of plus or, or, or minus 15 degrees can still be used, but with a little inaccuracy in our calculations. We have an example that we'll be looking at. It would just uh, clarify this point. But before we do that, the values of uh, the RB can be obtained either based on the equations that are given or figures like these. The figures here are given the value of RB as a function of the latitude and the month of the year in which we are doing the calculations. And again, it depends on the measurements that we are doing are being done in the hemisphere or uh, uh, northern part of the hemisphere or southern part of it. So uh, the values are given here for phi minus b is equal to 15, 0, minus 15 or vertical orientation of the surface. We have in this example, a collector that needs to be installed again in Madison. It's a city with a latitude of 43. It is to be having a slope of 60 degrees to the south, facing the south. Average daily radiation data is obtained in Appendix G. And in Appendix G, you'll find that there are some cities that I have given over there. And the average radiation daily or monthly are being given here as values. So for the city, or uh, it, it has it for several cities, for the cities that uh, you are studying, you can get back to that and see the value of H as given there. What about the cities that are not uh, listed in the appendix? That's something you can get easily by your local or uh, general kind of information. If you search for the internet for the value of H for a certain city, or if you consult your local agency. For here, for example, we talked about uh, several uh, uh, weather stations, but the most um, uh, reliable one that collects all the information is KKR, so that this is where you can get this information from. The ground reflect reflectance is 0 0.2 for all the months, except for December and March, where the values are 0 0.4. January and February, the value is 0 0.7. Using the isotropic diffuse assumption, estimate the monthly average radiation incident on the collector. Here it's asking about the monthly average radiation, and this value changes from a month to the other. So what we are going to do here is that we are going to do it for all the months from January to December. What's being given here in the example is the values that are being calculated for January as an example, and then the rest of the information has been calculated. The details are not given, but it's a repetition of this process and it is tabulated here, which means that when you are working or studying on this uh, part of the course in your own, what you are going to do is you are going to do it for January to understand it. And once it's done, you can repeat it for the rest of the month, compare the values that you obtain with the values that are given in the table uh, within the example. So again, we are talking about a collector, which is installed at a certain latitude, 43 degrees, at a certain slope, 60 degrees to the horizontal. It is facing south. And the values of uh, the reflectance for different months are given here, 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.7 for January, for um, uh, 0 0.2 for all the months, uh, for December and March in particular, it is 0 0.4. For January and February, it is 0 0.7, which means that they are showing higher reflectance from the ground there. What we need to do as a first step is the calculations of HD over H, the diffuse component over the total component, the fraction RB. We know that the, uh, the ratio HD over H is a function of KT, and it can be found either from equation 212.1 or 212.2. I've seen these equations in our previous class. For January, the midday from table 161 in chapter one is the 17th. So 17th of January is the day that we are going to consider here. So that N is equal to 17. And when you substitute into the declination angle expression, you'll get delta is equal to minus 20.9. 
the sunset hour angle is also given by an equation in uh, chapter one, equation one six ten. And when you substitute, you'll find the value of omega s is 69.1. Now, having n equal to 17, ws is equal to 69.1. So from equation 1103 or a figure or a table 1101, you can cal calculate the value of each node. Each node, it's uh, an expression which is given us the extraterrestrial radiation on a horizontal surface as a function of n delta omega s, which is the sunset angle. So each node has been calculated to be 13.36 megajoule per meter square. Go into the appendix, you'll find the value of h bar for this latitude for 43 degrees latitude is equal to 6.44 in January. And from there, when you, when you go to different months of the year, you'll find that there is a different value corresponding to each month. A different value will be for February, for March, for April. And this is a given data. It's some sort of an input data to, to be used uh, or to use in our program, in our solution for this example. Then the ratio of H bar over H node is our KT, and KT here is given as 0 0.48. Note the, the number 0 0.48, because we will see that in many, many of the approximation that will be given later, you find that they are given um, values of, uh, of, of that ratio of HD over H for a typical value of KT equal to 0 0.5. And they say that this is a value that, that can be a generalization for calculations of the hemisphere. And that's something for the Northern hemisphere. And you can see here, the 0 0.48 is very close to the, zero, to the 0 0.5 value. Now we're going to use the, the correlation for calculating HD over H. And the correlation is given here. I'm, giving, I'm showing it to you here, HD over H as a function of KT, you are going to substitute here for the value of KT equal to 0 0.48, and you will get HD over H is equal to 0 0.41, which means that the diffuse component of the incident irradiance is 41% of the total irradiance falling on a surface. The calculation of RB requires the sunset hour angle, and the expression of the sunset hour angle is given here. Actually, for the sunset hour angle, remember that we have seen here in, in the equation that I was just mentioning that we are going to calculate two values for the sunset hour angle, and we are going to take the smallest or the minimum value out of them. So this is basically what has been done in the example, and the values of the hour angle has been calculated from two formulas. One of them has given 96.7, the other is given 69.1, and this is the one that we are going to consider here substitute that in the equation of RB, and then you can get the ratio of the radiation falling on a tilted surface compared to the radiation falling on a horizontal surface. The equation of HT can now be expressed. We have the beam component, we have the isotropic diffuse component, and the reflected amount of energy from the ground, and this has been calculated to be a total of 13.7 megajoule per meter square. The first component here is the beam component, followed by the diffuse component using the isotropic diffuse model, and then the reflected value. Now, this has been done in January. And the values that we have been calculated a while are basically this. We have calculated H. Actually, H has been obtained from uh, the appendix. H note has been calculated from the equation. And then the ratio between them is the value of K. When you substitute in the expression of HD over H, which is a function of K, you get this ratio. And then from the equation of R, we get this ratio. The, uh, the ground uh, reflective, uh, reflectivity is being given, or reflectance is given as 0 0.7 for the month of January, and then Based on that, we calculate the value of HT here from the model. Then this is going to be repeated for the rest of the year. So the values of H bar are obtained from the appendix here for this latitude. And then 
you substitute into the expressions and get H naught, get K, KT, HD over H, R bar, who are given the values of rho S, and finally calculate the values of H. We are not covering uh, the part of average radiation on a slope surface, the KT method, since we have a method in hand so that we can be using the method that we have. Now, the question becomes, what about the effect of receiving a surface orientation on the value of HT? What if the orientation has changed for the receiving surface? The methods outlined in the previous section to estimate the average radiation can be used to show this effect, the effect of slope and azimuth angle on the total energy received on a surface either on a monthly basis, seasonal basis, or an annual basis. So what we are looking for here, the previous one was basically, we are considering a surface which is facing uh, south at a certain uh, slope. Here we are talking about what if the slope has changed and what if uh, the, the, the angle where it's not facing the equator, the equator, the angle has changed. So, to see that effect, we are considering here a certain special case, and the special case would be basically for a latitude angle of 45, gamma is taken equal to zero, and for a ground reflection, 0 0.2. The value of HT is being given as a function of HD over H, which is basically a function of KT. We are taking KT is equal to 0 0.5. This is what I just mentioned a while ago, that we are going to consider the previous example got as a value of KT is equal to 0 0.48. So if a value of 0 0.5 is not too far from this value. So it's going to be constant or considered to be constant throughout the year. So a typical value, which is a typical value for many temperature climates. The results have been given here in this figure. So we're looking at different months of the year, and we're looking for H and HT here as megajoule uh, per meter square per day. And you can find here for different values of beta, the slope, for every month, how the values can be calculated here. This is given basically for a case of, for a, a certain location of phi is equal to 45, the KT is taken as a typical value 0 0.5 and gamma equal to zero. That would imply that we can generate figures like this for different altitude angles. For example, you can do a figure like that in, in our location here in, in the MAM or in Dahran, and then you can get uh, or create a figure like that that would give you the value of H bar or get the value of HT for several months of, of the year. Are we going to need that? The answer is yes. Suppose that we need to, to put a solar collector at a certain inclination in one of our cities, then we should be able to estimate how much is the energy falling into it. Be it, I mean, a total value on a monthly basis or even on a daily basis. Then we look at the general problem of calculating radiation on a tilted surface, where total radiation on a horizontal surface is provided. And that's something that we have been seeing several times with, within this chapter and even the previous one. The previous chapter, we're looking at the beam component only. You are looking for the total component of radiation that can be calculated here for a certain period within the day uh, knowing what is the value of the radiation on a horizontal surface. And the model is very much the same as we have seen earlier for, for the edge. So it has a beam component, it has a diffuse component, and you see here that we are using the isotropic model and there is a reflected component from the ground. The one plus cosine beta over two and the one minus cosine beta over two is a representation of the shape factor between the surface that we have and the sky dome, the other one is the surface that we have and the ground or ground reflectivity. 
So Rb is given as cosine theta over cosine theta z, as we have seen previously in chapter one as well. And the ground reflectance radiation, it varies from 0 0.2 to 0 0.7, depending on the month of the year and the location that you have. I would probably say that 0 0.7, as they have mentioned earlier, that it's the value that is given for January and February because the snow is, is accumulating on the ground. So the surface of, of the ground becomes a little bit shiny and that's why the value of rho increases over there. The components of the radiations that are given in the equation are represented by that sketch here. So solar radiation, there is a beam component of it, which is falling on the surface directly. And this is the one given by the first expression here. Whereas the second expression here for the, uh, uh, for the diffuse component, which is basically scattered from particles suspended in the air or coming from the sky. But we're using an isotropic model. So we're assuming that it's a single component irrespective of the direction where it's coming from. So this is the diffuse component. And the third component is the component which is reflected. It fell on the ground and then reflected on the surface. When we are estimating the amount of energy which is falling on a collector like this, or in a window, if you are talking about uh, uh, the amount of energy that are passively used for uh, heating uh, windows in winter, for example, then these are the components of radiation that are to be calculated and you know that. And for a collector, it's very important because at the end, we are going to look at how much we can assess the efficiency of the collector. So for this case, we need to know exactly how much energy is falling in the collector. You can do it by one of two things. Either you can put a pyranometer, for example, on, on the surface, so it will measure to you how much is the solar radiation falling as or the irradiance in watt per meter square, or you can use this kind of expressions for the equations so that you can estimate how much is the total energy incident on a tilted surface like this. And the tilted surface for us will definitely be a solar collector, regardless of what type of solar collector that we are considering. The values of H has been, or, or, and, and, or the values of HT, are given here so that they are a function of the day of the month, again, for a latitude of 45. And for values of KT that are taken approximately are equal to 0 0.5, the surface is facing south. And we know that it is facing south, south, but we can have it as plus or minus 15 degrees with an acceptable accuracy. And this has been done with a value of ground reflectivity of 0.2. This is the condition during this period of the, of the year. We're talking about the months from May up to, um, it seems to me that it's, um, the figure is not very clear, but this is, it's, it's, it's like a representation of uh, a part of, of the year. So this is May, June, July, August, September. So it's from April to September. Whereas the, the values of the instant solar radiation through the rest of the year, which is basically the, uh, the winter season can be shown here by this shaded values, as you can see. This actually is leading us, talking about the effect of the tilt angle, is leading us to a very interesting result that you have been taken probably as some sort of a rule of thumb that people are using so that without calculations, or without going through the details, the, you'll find that people working in the industry of solar energy will tell you that when you are putting a solar collector, then you are going to, going to put it on a slope, which is equal to the latitude that you have. We are talking about two different angles. The slope is basically beta, which is how much is the angle with the horizontal. And the latitude, it is related to the locations that you are in basically in, uh, on the earth. What's the latitude angle? So it has become some sort of a rule of thumb that if you are going to put your solar collectors and fix it, 
at a certain angle throughout the years, you're not going to change the angle, then put it at an angle beta equal to phi, the latitude. Because the calculations, and we'll see that, are showing that this is the location where you can get best amount of radiation uh, throughout the year. If you need to be very accurate, then you may need to adjust it in summer so that the, the value of beta is going to be about 10 to 15 degrees less than phi, the latitude, whereas when you are talking about winter season, it's got to be 10 to 15 degrees more than the latitude. The error associated with these changes in the angle, 10 to 15 less or 10 to 15 more, is going to be not exceeding a value of 5%, which is not a big deal. Why I'm saying it's not a big deal? Because uh, talking about the amount of uh, radiation that has to be uh, considered falling on a surface, whether it is a fixed orientation surface or a tracking surface, it makes a lot of difference when you are talking about the capital cost of your unit. Tracking surface, it means that you are going to need motors, you are going to be axes, and then there's some sort of adjustment so that you can, you can even change the, the, the orientation or being able to put it in a way that even manual adjustment, that it should be some sort of an axis, and then you are going to have it at um, a value is equal to the, to the latitude most of the time, except for the summer season, where you are going to tilt it 10 to 15 degrees less than the attitude, and then the winter you have to adjust it 10 to 15 degrees greater than the latitude, so it's not basically a fixed orientation of the solar collector. Fixed orientation definitely is less costly. So the additional adjustment that you need to do is going to cost you a certain amount of capital cost so that you can make your collectors on an axis so that you can rotate them depending on the season. But all of what that we are talking about is going to, to, to result only a 5% uh, losses or a reduction of 5% of the, of the radiation, which is not worth the, the, the investment that you have to put in there. This is an estimation of what I just mentioned here. We're talking about the total annual uh, energy uh, and the winter values, by the way, and, and they are given as a function of the slope. And you can see here, for phi is equal to 45, a value of 45 will get us here. The difference here, talking about winter, is the 5% I'm talking about, whereas throughout the whole year, the value is almost closer to the maximum value. So it becomes then some sort of an acceptable uh, approximation to put or to, to install solar collectors that you have at a slope which is equal to the latitude that you have. This been given here or expressed here in, in further details. So the slope corresponding to the maximum estimated uh, total uh, energy in winter is approximately 60, which is basically the 45, the latitude plus 15. So a 15 degrees here is going to change uh, to result in a reduction in the incident radiation by 5%. And this has been uh, shown here in the figure by uh, the winter part, as, as you can see it here, 45 is the adjustment that we are putting equal to the latitude, whereas the maximum value is corresponding to 60, which is about 15 degrees difference in the value of beta. Um, this does not apply to us, the dashed part of the curve here, which is this, and this that would be the case if there is snow, because the reflectivity or the ground reflectance is, is, is quite high. So the values are going to be a little bit higher, which is falling on the surface. But again, the difference is not, is not significant. And since we don't have snow, so that does not apply to cities like, like what we are living in. But anyway, if it is there, the value of the ground reflectance is going to increase from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6. The difference in terms of the value, again, is not a significant one.
we see here the effect of receiving surface orientation again on the value of H bar T, the average monthly values. And you see here for beta equal to uh, 60 versus beta equal to 30, which are the, the upper and lower limit. We said that we normally do it for beta equal to 45, but in case of beta is set equal to 30 or 60, so there, that's the margin of variance that you would have for this kind of uh, calculations if the angle has changed a little bit. This work has been done by several other investigators and we are again getting sort of the same kind of expression here. So this is a confirmation that uh, actually it has been done originally by, uh, I think he was, uh, um, he's probably Klein, and then it has been done by uh, several others, other researchers for example, here it's given by given by Morse, and it is basically some sort of more or less it's a similar trend to what we have seen in the previous cases. So that that would just confirm that uh, the rule of thumb that is been mentioned by taking uh, the slope of a solar collector at an angle equal to the angle of the latitude becomes some sort of uh, a best uh, fixed location throughout the whole year. So this is the rule of thumb that it's been repeated again. And please keep on remembering that when you are putting a solar collector for your application, you're going to put it for a value which is equal to the latitude. Uh, probably I mentioned that earlier to you that we have um, a set of solar collectors that we are using. We have flat plate collectors that are located in uh, the research area in the, in the University Beach. And we have PV panels, which are located over there. We have uh, evacuated tube collectors that we are putting in, uh, in over there and in, in the beach, as well as here uh, next to building 26. And for all of them, we are fixing them, we are making stands, or actually have ordered the stands so that they would just give us a net value of the slope of about 26. And 26 is the latitude of the Haran or the map. Talking about the surface azimuth angle, the best thing is to make it facing south because again, uh, a deviation from the south is going to result in the total amount of uh, radiation falling into the surface. This we are talking about the northern hemisphere, the upper part of the earth or the hemisphere. For those people the, at the lower part, they make their collectors facing north. Deviations of the azimuth angle of about 10 or 20 degrees centigrade, uh, 10 and 20 degrees may have a small effect on the annual radiation or annual energy which is falling into the surface. Uh, I would probably, uh, it's 9, 12, now I'm going to, uh, to stop here. And then um, the rest of this presentation is some sort of, uh, yeah, yeah it, it has a very interesting, uh, topic which is, uh, which is the idea of the utilizability of the solar collectors, which is more or less some sort of an energy balance. I'm not going to talk about that in details today, just to give enough time for the quiz and then we can keep it for our next uh, class as, uh, as we are going also to go through some sort of a revision of uh, some of the useful heat transfer topics that we have covered earlier. So the, the whole thing about this is that we're looking at when the solar collectors are going to be useful. There is energy by radiation falling into the solar collectors, energy gain, which is the three components that we have beam, diffuse, as well as the reflected radiation. But the surface of the solar collectors gets heated. And because it gets heated, its temperature exceeds temperature of the atmosphere. So it starts to lose energy to the atmosphere because of the temperature difference. Then, when is it going to be useful? It is going to be useful whenever the energy falling into it exceeds the value of the energy loss. This is where there will be some sort of a positive gain that you can make use of it for either for heating fluid or for generating electricity. 
But if you are in a situation where these values are equal, which is basically the value of the radiation equal to the amount of lost radiation, we call it the critical value of the radiation falling in. If we are talking about a critical radiation level, then whatever you are getting is equal to what you are losing. So it's not useful then. But if it is less, definitely don't use the solar collector. We are talking about a surface which is not receiving enough radiation, but it is losing energy to the surroundings, so it's going to cool down. But whenever it is greater than the critical radiation level, then it, it becomes start to be useful. It can be utilized. So this is the basic idea behind what we call the utilizability uh, idea for the solar collectors. So um, at this moment, I'm going to stop here and uh, please refer to the blackboard, open the blackboard in your, uh, in your computers and you'll find that the quiz has been released. I set it in a way that it should be released and available at 9.15.